so you you cover and you talk about Abraham and God's relationship with Israel and the psalmist and lamenting, and then you get to Job. And this is the part that I wanted to talk to you about, especially because Job is a book that I have read and, and studied a good bit, but I've never taught through it. I've never translated the book and taught through it. And it's a book that I've had, I don't know how many times when I was on staff at church, pastor of discipleship. So I oversaw small groups and curriculum. And when, when different small groups wanted to do different studies, they come to office and, you know, we'd find them material to study regularly had people saying our group wants to study job and i hadn't it's like <laughs> oh good luck have at it yeah. uh just know that you're going to have different interpretations as many as there are books on it um so tell me first of all do what degree of historicity do you see job is it on the spectrum of its history and the events literally happened and his children literally died and satan you know or the angel literally appear before God to the other spectrum, which says it's all parable. It's all uh, just a story. None of it really happened. There was never even a guy named Job. Mm -hmm. um, it's just Hebrews wrestling with life suffering and nothing more. So where in that continuum yeah. do you fit and why? Yeah, so there is a legendary character named Job mentioned in the book of Ezekiel. Um, and so there is some knowledge of a person named Job, but Book of Job is a wisdom book. Uh, you know, a wisdom book is not a historical book. Uh, historical books are very different in, in style, and I think the whole question, though, of whether Job is a book about events that actually happened or not, is a sidetrack, a total si modernist sidetrack. We are so concerned with the book of Job having events that actually happened because starting in the 19th century, we became historically oriented in the center. We want to understand what the data of the past were, what really happened, what as opposed to legends. Mm -hmm. And so we are caught in this modernist mind trap. And, you know, the rabbis debated, was Job a parable or was Job a real person? And they couldn't agree on it um, in the ancient times. It didn't really matter because the point of the book of Job does not depend on its being historical. In general, I would say, and there may be some exceptions, but in general, trying to ask about historicity in Old Testament books, which go back really far and when they're written, I mean, they're written two and a half thousand to, to three thousand years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Ask about historicity, what really happened, is almost always a sidetrack from listening to what the book actually says. Mm -hmm. It's an, the, the modernist thing is that we want to get behind the literature to the events. We want to get to the, the world behind the text, as Paul Ricoeur talked about it, rather than the world of the text. And the events behind the text are not the authority for our lives. It's the text in its literary rhetoric, the way it's said, you know, the poetry of the Psalms. You could reduce the, you know, this beautiful Psalms to some propositional statements. That's not what's authoritative. It's the Psalm itself in its mm. poetic beauty. Um, so the book of Job is a wisdom book set up like a platonic dialogue with different characters dialoguing with each other. And in the beginning, you don't know who is right. Is Job right to curse the day of his birth? Are the friends right to say, that's not the right kind of speech. You shouldn't talk that way with God uh, listening. And then Job laments directly to God. Are, who is right? Is Job's wife right? Curse God and die? You know, um, mm -hmm. what's the right? So I look at the book of Job as a test case of this question. What is right speech in a situation of terrible suffering? Mm -hmm. Historically, that may have come out of the exile or in the post-exilic period and people reflecting on it. Certainly the book of Job is very relevant to Jewish people thinking about the Holocaust or as they call it, the Shoah. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's relevant to any situation of suffering. Linking it to one historical period is really not that important to me. I don't even care when it was written. I think it was a Persian age book after the exile, but I'm never going to push that really strong because nothing too much depends on it. The book has its own power, drawing you in to explore which theology is the best theology of suffering. And when Job laments to God and cries out at the end, God says to Job's friends, y'all, plural, y'all, y'all have not spoken to me what is right as my servant Job had, because the only one who spoke to God directly in prayer. The book of Job is about the reassertion of lament against positions which say it's inappropriate to protest to God. Did a real Job exist? I don't know. Does it really matter? I don't think so. It's a sidetrack.
Do you think, let me just as a quick aside, because the, the other book that frequently gets this similar type of discussion is Jonah. And because of how it's structured as almost yeah. a, a parable or a story, but yeah. yet it's within the prophets and it's linked to a pro So do you think that with Jonah, it's just as, I don't want to say irrelevant, but just as inconsequential, whether it's history okay. or not, or do you think it's a little more? So that's interesting. The... So, so if you look in Kings, Jonah is mentioned just in one, I think one or two verses as a prophet. There's not much said about him. Hmm. It's possible that where he is located um, in the history, is relevant that the book of Jonah, which I think is a later parable, I do think so, is meant to affect one's reading of Kings. Hmm. That's possible. So there, that it's like the superscriptions of the Psalms. This is the Psalm that David prayed and so on. So if you took away the superscription, you'd never know the Psalm, anything to do with that, because right. it's a generic Psalm, but it's a, it's a, so somebody under the inspiration of the spirit put that heading, somebody connected Jonah to that history. Because maybe you got to read that history together with the book of Jonah and wonder yeah. what's going on in prophecy at that time. Because Jonah is being critiqued as a prophet who has a very right. narrow point of view. And it's very possible some of the prophets had very narrow points of view. Yeah. Uh, the Apostle Paul, speaking of prophecy in the Corinthian church, is relevant to Old Testament. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Mm -hmm. Prophets don't speak by dictation. They receive right. a message and they put it in whatever language they want to when they think it's appropriate. Yeah. And Jonah did not want to prophesy. Yeah. And all he prophesied was, for the days and Nineveh should be destroyed. Then he ran for cover, hoping that it would be destroyed from lightning. And, and it, there was a repentance. Even the cows repented, put on sackcloth and ashes, <laughs> which, of course, is humorous, right? a very humorous right. book. And, and, and Jonah gets critiqued for his short-sightedness. And so he quotes uh, Exodus 34, that revelation yeah. of the divine name. To God, I knew you were a God who was merciful and compassionate and forgave sins. Damn it, that's why I didn't want to go to these Assyrians. I wanted <laughs> yeah. them to be destroyed. So yeah. he, he resists God. So that message is relevant whether Jonah exi even existed or not. Maybe mm -hmm. one might read it with the historical, with Kings, and think about how this speaks to that story. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't studied that in any great depth. Yeah. But that's, it's, a I... very, it's a very funny book. You know, after Jonah laments uh, in, in the belly of the fish, uh -huh. even though he was... <laughs> Everything he says in the belly of the fish is wrong. It's actually totally wrong, irrelevant to the story. And yeah. the fish says, I can't take it no more. Ugh, and vomits <laughs> him out. Him I mean, it's actually yeah. it's actually part of the humor, but most people don't get that because they're looking for the historical evidence. Yeah. Yes. Or they treat it as a fable uh, yeah. of, of, you know, how we should not be afraid to go where God calls us because he's got bigger yeah. plans than we can uh, possibly imagine. Yeah. And Jonah's part treated it. as the good guy. And I always That's tell people, no, Jonah's the bad guy Jonah's in the story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I love that. This isn't, we, we, that's a tangent to the discussion, but it, my mind went there because Jonah and Job are two books yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that there's, I think, legitimate. And I say this as an evangelical who believes yeah. in the authority and inspiration of scripture, that that doesn't mean that you read every book as history. No. And those are two where I would say, I, I, I lean to them being something, not history, uh, something so. more. So, so let, 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 me, let me interject this point for, mm -hmm. for listeners who might be worried about Middleton going liberal or something, right? <laughs> I affirm with Paul that if Jesus has not been raised from the dead, our faith is vain. Because if God did not act in history to redeem the world, then what am I believing in? It's just myth. And I don't believe in a myth. I believe in an actual story of redemption. Now, some of the literature that's part of that story, you got to look at the genre of the literature. Yes. But, but there are certain historical events that are that ground the story. Absolutely. Well, and, and speaking of looking at the literature, when you do look at Job, you uh, there are four characters who have people have had questions about in Job in particular that I wanted to get your thoughts on. You can mm -hmm. be as brief and concise as you want. Two human or two one human character, which is uh, uh, Elihu or Elihu or however you want to pronounce his name, and because he's always he kind of comes on the scene at the end and sort of the young buck that kind of says, "Listen, old people, sit down. I'm going to talk." And and he doesn't specifically get rebuked by God when God shows up and rebukes Elihu is kind of left out. So some people I think have even said he's just kind of thrown in there as as a later addition to the text. Uh, so what do you, what are your thoughts on uh, Elihu, and then on the angel, the the Satan, I should say, the accuser, 
most people read that and just think it's Satan and he's running around up in heaven and on earth and this and that. And others say, no, he's, he's not even evil at all. He's just an angel that that's his job as the divine prosecutor or the, the attorney, the, the, the DA. And then the other two characters, uh, Behemoth and Leviathan, people have said everything from dinosaurs, which I don't know of any fire breathing dinosaurs, but whatever. Uh, some people have said, oh, it's just a fanciful way of describing a crocodile and hippopotamus. Uh, but they're known throughout the ancient Near East as well. So those four characters, give us a quick Cliff's Notes. Yeah. How, how does Richard interpret each of those four? Yeah. So Elihu is the fourth person who comes in. The three friends have been dialoguing with Job. Job gives a bunch of chapters of his speeches of innocence. And then Elihu comes in and says, you know, you guys, you old footy duddies, I respect you, so I let you finish. But I got something to say. The young people have something to say because God's given me direct revelation. It just doesn't come through the, the hoary ages like what you were talking about. So let me tell you. And he quotes a lot of what they say, but he often misquotes what they say and gives his answers. And his answers are no different in content to what the others have been giving. But he says it's different. In fact, he has this very lengthy introduction saying, I'm going to say something different. And the introduction is very long and doesn't give out any substance whatsoever. If you started a speech like that, I go to sleep before you got to the main <laughs> point, right? And I think that historically, it's a later addition to the book, mm. but it's now part of the biblical canon. It's now part of the book. And it's very interesting that the way the book works is Elihu finishes speaking and it says, and the Lord answered Job. Just ignored that guy because what he had to say was utterly irrelevant. That's the way it functions in the book as a whole. Mm. This is one more point of view that tries to be different and doesn't have anything worthwhile to say. Let's move on and get to answer Job because he's really the one who's been speaking to God. Nobody else has been speaking to God. That's why I view Elihu. Okay. Maybe a later literary edition, but it has an important function in the book to keep delaying you getting to the point where you say, come on, God, answer, answer, answer. Oh, finally, God's going to answer. Okay. Which is the kind of thing that Job would be yearning for listening to Elihu. Oh, my goodness. More people criticizing me. Uh, let me hear what God has to say. Right. Okay. Um, let me do Behemoth and Leviathan first. Okay. Um, Leviathan is a, is a creature that is known from the ancient Aries. The, the Ugaritic myths have this litan or lotan, depending on how you, you vocalize it. That's the same root, um, word. Described in the same way as, as elsewhere in the Bible, a seven-headed monster and so on. I don't think that's fire breathing. That's unique to Job, this part. If it, you know, by the way, um, Tolkien describes Smaug in The Hobbit taking his cue from Leviathan. Oh, I never picked up on that. It's when, when Smaug describes himself to, to Bilbo, uh -huh. he's using some of the same imagery from the Leviathan story. That's another oh, whole thing. Now I have to, to go back into. and reread it. That's wonderful. <laughs> um, um, and behemoth is just the, the, the word for um, cattle or livestock. The plural word is a singular word in Hebrew, behemoth. So behemoth is the plural. It's sometimes used to mean animals in the Bible, but it, in here it means mega animal, biggest mm. possible land animal that it is. Well, it's in the water as well. Um, it, you know, it's, it's in the modern period that someone for the first time, I think it's an early modern period, suggested this was a hippopotamus mm. and Leviathan was a crocodile. But it has never mm. thought to be that before. And of course, it's irrelevant to think about dinosaurs because nobody in the text knew about dinosaurs. And you cannot attribute meaning to a text that was not in the mind of the author in some way or another. Mm -hmm. That's just bad biblical exegesis. So these are mythic creatures. The point about it is these mythic creatures are viewed as evil in the world, in the ancient world. And God is saying, I created behemoth as the first of my mighty works. An almost identical phrase is said of wisdom says, I was created as the first of God's mighty works in Proverbs 8. This is a good creature. It is a dangerous creature. You get too close and it'll kill you. And Leviathan, we're specifically told, nobody can tame him. Uh, even the gods are afraid of him. This is mythological language, right? So don't try and hook him with a hook or anything. He will not speak soft words to you. He breathes fire. He's as dangerous as Yahweh is, basically. You know, at Sinai, don't come too close. Well, there's a whole debate you had with Carmen. No, no you didn't have it. Uh, the Bible project had with Carmen about should they have come too close or not. But I think in... Uh -huh. This is a dangerous monster. God is saying, don't get too close to Leviathan. He is not evil. So what God is doing is reframing dangerous monsters and saying they're good creatures, but they're not for humans to play with. Now, why does God do that? The whole point that God does that is to say, Job, don't you realize you are just like these monsters? And your friend's been afraid of you. And they're trying to tame you. And they can't tame you. I like good monsters. 
God is basically Steve Irwin saying, beautiful creature, beautiful creature, just depending on young, but don't come too close, man. I love these creatures. I protect them. So, Job, I affirm your wild, untamable language. Don't think I'm afraid of that. It doesn't bother me. It bothers your friends. It doesn't bother me. So God is encouraging Job's lament by these monsters. That's what I and a number of other scholars read these creatures. That's really, I, that's a really, uh, just before you get into the, the yeah. Satan accuser, that's a, for, for those listening that are hearing that for the first time, uh, to unpack the ideas that just as God is not afraid or doesn't even flinch at the scariest, mightiest, most chaotically unpredictable things in the ancient mind, Leviathan and Behemoth, he can certainly handle the questions that Job is throwing at him. Right. They're doing nothing to to endanger him in any way. Is that what? Right. That's right, okay. yeah. And, and there are two speeches of God. The first speech corrects Job's theology, and that renders Job silent. And that's why there's a second speech. God's all right. Okay, you know that you're, I'm a professor. Sometimes I'll challenge a student and it shuts them up. And I want to actually have them re respond to me. So I've got to put, draw them out. So God says, all right, let me give you two examples of monsters that I'm not afraid of. Let, you know, I'm not afraid of your questions. Come on, yeah. speak up like them, you know. And yeah. the, the, big, the biggest description of both Behemoth and Leviathan is that they have large mouths. Hmm. And, and so that's mm -hmm. the analogy he's given with Job. I don't care about big mouth people. It's fine. Talk, man, <laughs> talk, you know. <laughs> Yeah, that's bad. OK, that's that's okay. really fascinating. If people are watching this, go back and read the speeches at the end of Job in light of what Richard's saying and see how it lands with you and, and read it that way, because I guarantee for most people and and being somebody who reviews study Bibles, I don't know of many study Bibles that even unpack all of these things. Uh, so this is something that I, reader, listeners, viewers, watchers. Pay attention to these type of insights in how you're reading this ancient text because it's fascinating yeah. stuff. And JM, I'm gonna, I want to follow up on a, some, a suggestion you made outside of this video that mm. maybe you and I work together to produce these two chapters, e either a standalone study guide to, to Job or a little book or a video series or something because we need an introduction at a, a yes. lay level to the book of Job that uses these insights. I would do. I'm. I'm on board already. You just tell yeah, me what to do. And... We're gonna work it out. We're gonna work it out. <laughs> yes. Man. All right. It really is. When I ask, because I, I did not know. I mean, other than like the old, uh, you know, old Tyndall commentary or something. I, I just don't have resources. I don't know of resources that can help lay. I want somebody needs to do for Job what Carmen has done for Exodus and yes, Sinai. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think there's fruitful there. Okay, so tell us okay. the angel, Satan, so, yeah, the accuser. So, so ha Satan means the accuser. The majority of times the word Satan is used in the in the Old Testament. It's used for a human being who's an a, opponent in some way that opposes a human being, often by accusing them or slandering them, not only in that way. You have to read um, the, the Satan, and it's a title, not a name. It, Satan becomes a name much later in New Testament times. Mm -hmm. But you have to read this as a title. And the question is, what is it a title of? And you look literarily within the book itself to see how is he actually portrayed. And then you ask, what was the beliefs of the time about the angelic beings around God? It gives you some little bit of uh, um, control beliefs about that. And when you think about it, the Satan is not the devil. The way that we think of the devil, that's a later idea. It doesn't really crystallized to maybe the second century BCE, mm -hmm. uh, the way we think of it as the head of the angels. And by the way, there is nowhere in the Bible that ever speaks of a primordial fall of Satan. That is a later idea. It actually comes out of the Enoch literature and, and enters the Christian literature through Milton. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's really unusual. It does not come from the Bible itself. So what you have here is a literary figure who opposes God. You can say with God's this, you know, um, attorney who's going to try and challenge challenge God and, and try and find fault, all that kind of stuff. You can do that. There are analogies in the ancient world of the Persian Empire. That's all interesting. I'm not going to go there right now. Just going to say, this is someone who challenges God and says that, you know, you do this to Job, but he will curse you. Mm -hmm. And he, the, the figure of the Satan does not show up in the conclusion to Job because it's a figure to get the story started, but it's not important to the story. Whether the author of Job believed there was actually a, an, an angel that was the opposing angel of God or not doesn't even matter for the story. Mm. He may have thought that he may not. The story has its own integral liter literary function. Mm. 
-hmm. And you read the story for what it actually says. You read the world of the text and don't speculate too much about the world behind the text in the author's mind or in the, the culture. That's interesting, but don't let it dominate the text. That's the way I think of it. You know, there are some scholars that if you when when you say don't speculate too much about the world behind the text, you just destroyed their entire careers. I know because I know. They, that's all they do is seem to speculate. And, and, about. and, and some are skeptical and some are <laughs> trusting. They're yeah. both in the same camp. They both mm -hmm. think that the history behind the text is more important than the text, which is not. Yeah. It okay. contributes to it. But we don't know a whole lot about the history behind the text, to be yeah. honest. Well, it's refreshing to hear that here somebody admitting that and, and being so candid and frank, I think you're absolutely right. So if you are interested watching this in what Richard is talking about, if you perked up when he said that the Bible never describes the fall of Satan, a primordial fall of Satan, that may be new to a lot of people. Check the video. I'm going to put a link in the description below. We have our own esteemed Professor Daredevil of Superhero Seminary here who talks about the origin of Lucifer and where that concept of the devil came from and how Milton, rather than scripture, is who is largely responsible for it. So check that out for a, a more lighthearted approach or introduction to that topic. Real quick, let me ask you before we move on. So I've been doing a series here on Disciple Dojo on our YouTube channel on ancient Near East backgrounds in the Bible. And I did one recently about, you know, are there dragons in the Bible? And we talked about Leviathan and the different uh, iterations of that chaos monster myth. And in the, in the Ugaritic epic, uh, Baal is the one, Baal kills Leviathan. But then when the Anat comes on, she boasts about killing a Leviathan. I just, I've read a couple of different theories, but I'm not an ancient Near East specialist. So uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on what's happening there? Did she do it? Is she boasting, bragging for something that Baal yeah. actually did because she's so wild and unpredictable? Yeah. Or are they like so joined together in the minds of the people that what one does, the other does? Uh, yeah. How do you approach that? I'll preface this by saying I am not an expert on Ugaritic literature either. That's mm -hmm. not my area. But one thing I do know is the Baal cycle. Notice mm -hmm. the term cycle. is not a mm -hmm. unified story. It's a collection of different stories. So it could be that there were different myths and legends around about Baal's conquest of Leviathan or death, the god mm -hmm. Mot, and mm -hmm. then Anna's conquest of Leviathan. So there is these different um, myths around, and they got put together in the cycle of stories. But these are on different tablets. You know, and was it one story? I don't think it was from what I can understand. So that's what I think is going on. Okay. That's a, yeah, that's a good insight. And I, I'm trying to work through presenting those concepts to a popular audience and I'm doing it as a secondary and not as an Ugaritic scholar yeah. as well. So that's the challenge that we it's, have. It's important to understand that ancient Near Eastern mythology is full of contradictions. Mm -hmm. It's a hodgepodge of all kinds of different beliefs because there is no authoritative text like the Bible. People in different right. places, the different versions of the myths and the legends. And so, you know, which deity is doing what? As a generation passes and another deity rises, this deity takes the place of that deity in a myth and so forth. Even in right. Enuma Elish, the Babylonian creation story, you know, Marduk is the chief god of Babylon who kills Tiamat. But in the Assyrian recension, Ashur, the God of Assyria is the one who kills Tiamat. So right, right. You know, they just keep shifting this thing around, man. Yeah, I, I get it. And it's I, I think of it because I am, you know, a, a pop culture and comic book superhero nerd. And I just think of, well, in the Marvel comics, Spider-Man was this. But in the Marvel movies, he was this. And they just both I mean, exist. And, and, and in which and in which universe, right? Which multiverse was yeah, he in? Yeah. <laughs> was he like, you know, yeah, yeah. That, that may be, I may have to do a video telling people, think of it that way. But, okay. Okay. <laughs>